in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to someone and say, let that light shine. Let, let that light shine. Let that light shine. It is wonderful to worship the Lord and to be in his presence. And especially when it seems like when we start singing about heaven, uh, one, we want to go there. Uh, we're ready to experience his goodness and his greatness in that area. And then also it just reminds us that, that heaven's not moved by what's going on here on the earth in the sense that uh, heaven's not worried about what's happening here. God's able to move, amen? And I just want to, again, just to, to stir us and to remind us after we've spent these few moments in worship and predominantly focusing on Jesus and heaven, um, I ran across a scripture the other day. You ever been one of those where you ran across a scripture and thought, wow, I, I, I know I've read it, but maybe I hadn't seen it quite like that before. And uh, if you would, quickly turn back into Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33. I know it's maybe not a book that you spend a lot of time in, um, but there's a, a portion of scripture I want us to read and then for us to pray quickly. Um, and when you're based on the word and you pray, it, always, it doesn't always have to be long, but it has to be consistent in some areas. And right now there's a lot of uh, fear that's being um, promoting prayer, unfortunately, especially in situations like with Afghanistan, places uh, uh, and where right now there is a lot of terrible things that are happening. But we should have been praying for Afghanistan before uh, there was a terrible thing happening. Um, and if we're not careful, we don't, uh, we don't pray about a situation until the news tells us about it. And then if we do it that way, then we're just following after the devil. The devil has more influence over what we pray about than the Bible does. But I want us to just take a moment here and read this portion of Scripture in Job chapter 33, uh, verses 14, um, and we're maybe through 18 here. And with this, in, uh, this thought in, uh, in, in mind... No one is, is isolated from God. Not even the worst of the worst can hide from the voice of God. Now here in Job chapter 33, verse 14, it says, For God speaks in one way and in two, the, uh, though man does not perceive it in a dream, in a vision at night, when, he, he, when deep sleep falls upon men while they slumber in their bed, then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings that they may turn a man aside from his deeds and to conceal pride and, uh, of, of a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. What is he saying? God will do all that he can to try to rescue lives. And even sometimes when there are people that are, uh, seemingly don't want to hear about God, when they are in the deep of their sleep, God can still speak to them. Even when people feel like they are maybe, uh, someone would say, well, they're isolated in a country where you can't preach the gospel. You can't keep God out of speaking to someone's heart and speaking to them. Think for just a moment, back in the Old Testament, when God spoke to Pharaoh's heart in a dream. And by doing so, he not only saved a, a region, and a whole nation, a region, but also the lineage uh, of Jesus. I was just thinking uh, where God spoke to Abimelech when he had um, mistakenly, because of, of misinformation, took Abraham to his wife, Sarah, to be his wife. And in a dream, God spoke to him and said, you're a dead man. You've taken another man's wife. Spoke to him in a dream and revealed something to him. I think over in the New Testament, in the New Testament, when Potiphar's wife told him, stay away from dealing with this Jesus, I've suffered much in a dream over him. And so here we have people that weren't even following God, weren't even interested necessarily in God, but God spoke to them. Well, if God can do that in the Old Testament, can do that in Potiphar's wife, there's some, some, uh, some real teaching there the, who had the real ear of the king in that situation. But in our life and in our day, folks, we can look at the world and we can say how bad it is. We can look at some of these dictators and some of these situations and how cruel they are, but why don't we pray that in the depth of their sleep, while they're at night asleep, that God speaks to them, and understand my terminology, in such a way it terrifies them. It, it awakens them. 
Have you ever been driving down the road? Maybe um, Art Whitty can testify with this. Ever been riding down the road and uh, at night and gets real, you know, it's hard to stay awake and all of a sudden I'm driving and he's beside me and we both wake up at the same time? You know what? We could use the word terrified right there at that particular moment. Well, the, the, that, that awakens you to get back in track where you're supposed to be and where you're supposed to go. I'm not asking God to necessarily terrify people so they'll be afraid of God in a bad way. I want them to see that God is merciful and he has a better way for them to go. What would be better for a revival to break out in North Korea than if the dictator got born again? What would be better in the Taliban if some of the leaders got saved along the way here and got born again? Well, how would anybody preach the gospel to them? Folks, there's ways God can get people. If necessary, he could take you from your seat and put you right there just as he did Philip and to be able to preach the gospel with him. So whatever it needs to be. But folks, let's take a moment and in, in just in the urgency of the hour, yes, but let's take this as a teaching moment so that we're not waiting for the next crisis that the news tells us about, but that we're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. What does he want us to be praying about? As you read through some of these verses like this or when you're going through your daily, reading your chapter a day, Holy Spirit, what are you wanting to teach me so that you can use me? Not just so that I got more information, but I'm more usable along the way. And we run across scriptures like this, and we can stop and say, you know what? It's been too long since I've prayed for the leader of, the North, of North Korea. It's been too long since I've prayed for the Communist Party of China. It's been too long since I've prayed for, for, for maybe uh, some of my neighbors or, or situations, whatever it might be. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to be able to open up whatever he can do, and he can speak to them in their night, so much so that when Pharaoh woke up, he said, i got to figure out this thing. Uh, Potter, for his wife, when she woke up, she went and told her husband, uh, stay away from this situation. Abimelech, when he woke up the next morning, he said, i got to get this thing straight in my life. So it's a wonderful... Now, we're not just leaving it all up to God. God, you go save the world, and i got groceries to go get. But we're... We're saying, Holy Spirit, this is the day of the supernatural. Amen? This is the day where God wants to move supernaturally. And we need the miraculous to be moving. Evil is moving too, too much right now. And too obvious. It's just too obvious. And, and the church needs to rise up and do our part in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. And so let's pray. And, and so um, we'll close also with praying there for the church in some of these situations. If you were a Christian in Afghanistan right now, would you want someone praying for you? If you were a Christian in North, Amer or North uh, Korea, North America, which uh, maybe it was prophetic, I don't know, but North Korea, I don't mean to be too light there, but we need to be praying one for another. Be strong in the Lord, keep our witness clear, and that we'll uh, do whatever God has called us to do in this time. Paul was in prison, so he had a, had a revival. Paul was taken to Rome under the guards of, of Caesar himself, so he got him saved. We oftentimes look at these situations as negative, and, and what we need to say is maybe this is an opportunity to reach people's lives that need to know Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your divine presence in our life. And Father, we do ask for the Holy Spirit to stir within us. We want to be your church that is motivated by your heart, led by your spirit, and we're asking that you would open our spiritual eyes so that we could see the wonderful works of your word and how you want to work through us. Lord, it's so easy for us in this day and age to become critical. It's so easy for us in this day and age uh, to even, even have discontent towards others or even hatred to get a seed in our life. And yet Jesus died for all men. And so we ask Holy Spirit, by the mercy and grace of God, that you are at work in this world. And if necessary, you speak through dreams and visions even to the lost and even to those that are in places of influence that could have control. And we ask that you would speak to them in a way that it would stir them. Under the context of what we're talking, it would terrify them of your greatness. It would remind them of your, of your control. And for those, Lord, that would be stiff-necked and that would not uh, yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit, they would not, uh, that would be in contrary to your plans, we're asking, Father, that there would be confusion in their camp 
and that they would be, uh, be hindered from accomplishing their will. So that for the main purpose, Lord, not just our safety, but for the salvation of others, so that there be a great harvest that would be brought in in this day. So we thank you, Lord, for that work. And that harvest, that harvest may it be brought in by bold, courageous believers that are around this world that you have already placed in positions that they are there to make bold witness of the goodness of God. And so we just thank you, Lord. They'll be courageous. They'll see the leading of the Holy Spirit, but also they'll be warned of any traps that the enemies would have set before them, and they'll be able to, to be a witness in this day and this hour for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop, I'm not going to stop praying. So I encourage you to keep on praying along that. There's a scripture there that you can put it down and, uh, and, and pray along that line. It would be good for us to keep it up. Um, we had the, our verse from Wednesday night there on, uh, out of Psalm 119, verse 18, where I encourage you to keep on meditating on that verse this week and praying that out, uh, opening our spiritual eyes so we can see the will and the plan of God and his wonderful word come to pass in our life. And so I encourage you to keep on doing that. Also, um, we had mentioned, but um, we are praying for Emma Bruning's family. Um, she passed away this last week, and praise God, she's in heaven shouting glory, and we're, we're always uh, grateful for those that have gone on and transitioned from this world. Um, we are going to have a, a, a visitation is at 10, and then the funeral is at 11 on Tuesday at Duker Hall. And so if you'd like to be at the visitation or the, the, uh, the funeral, Visitation at 10, funeral following at 11 at Duker Hall. And so you can be praying for them. Also today we have the great privilege and opportunity to have the Flores family back with us from, from Panama. So it's good to have them back. If uh, you uh, have maybe a guest today with us, uh, we, if you're in for a, a great treat and update here on just what God's doing in, in their lives and, um, and, and while, Jorge, while you're standing to come, Jessica, you might as well stand up so everyone can, can get a, uh, if there's some, if there are guests or new people they can see. I, come on up, Jorge, you're going to grab the, <laughs> grab your microphone on the way by. It's not been that long, dude. You know how this procedure goes here, so. And so come on up, and it's wonderful. Uh, of course, you'll, the, oh, no, you're supposed to wait, aren't you? That's right, my fault. Go sit by my wife. Don't sit by my wife. Um, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I got, got excited about them being here. Um, in just a minute, they're going to show a video here. It's going to kind of do a few moments of summary uh, of, uh, of what they've accomplished so far. And, um, and they've got a lot of wonderful videos that are out there. But I told Jorge when he come, we, we want to see him. We want to see him and Jessica and the family and hear from them on what's on their heart just for us. Um, but again, for some of you that maybe didn't know, um, they were staff members with us for, for quite some time here at the church, and a blessing to be with us and to be able to see what God is doing in their life, and uh, just to be able to, just an incredible story of how they got where they're at, but um, we want them to be able to share some of those good things with us in just a moment. So here's a short video, and after the video, then Jorge will come and share. It has been a year and a half since we moved our family to Panama, Central America. We have been to places unimaginable. To the ends of the earth. We have met some of the most beautiful and kind-hearted people. help from our ministry team, we have shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to thousands of children. Together, we distributed over 1,800 food bags. Together, we have fed the hungry in over 90 cities, towns, and communities.
thank you for coming along on this journey. Good morning. Wow, it's so good to be back. And uh, yeah, God bless you. As much as, you know, one tries to prepare with what, you, you know, what I'm going to say this morning to our sending church, um, there, there really aren't any words to, that can express our gratitude and our appreciation, our love for you guys. Um, as the video says, thank you for being a part of a year and a half's journey while we've been in Panama. We served here five years, so that's like almost seven years, right? But I remember the very first time I stepped foot here on a Sunday, uh, Pastor Dennis called me out. He said, this is, uh, this is your introduction. I can't quote you word by word, but you said, uh, you know, he, he was pretty much offering me to come and be the children's pastor here. Uh, and he said, um, you know, you kind of have to take this. He pretty much put, put me against the wall, and I ended up uh, making one of the best decisions of my life, of our lives, my family's and my life, and uh, serving here for five years. Good training grounds. My goodness. Good training grounds. And I, I can't help but talk about our Friday night uh, community outreach that has been, for the meantime, put on hold. But we'll believe that um, Grandview will be able to get back to uh, doing that on Friday nights. But I remember Pastor Dennis mentioning up here one time that Grandview Church had, had handed out, had given over 20,000 hot dogs to the community. And so our family in Panama, um, you know, doing the food distribution uh, during the pandemic, I can't help but think that Grandview activated that in us. That Grandview had a big part of what God has us doing in Panama. And I thank you for that, Marilyn. I thank you for that, Pastor Dennis. Um, but really, and that's, and, and, and God, I feel God keeps saying to us, watch what I'm doing. I feel like God's saying to us, maybe not in so many words, hey, if the world wants to pour gasoline on itself and set itself on fire, let them. What am I doing, he says. And what is he doing? If we go to uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. I just want to share this to encourage you guys. Um, we're living in some very interesting times, but I've always, I was saying this even before the, pandemics, uh, the pandemic began. I was saying, what a time to be alive. Wow. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31 says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. They had what? I find it interesting that right before that, uh, the scripture introduces Paul, or Saul, who through his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, became Paul, right? And so, we know the story, uh, he goes to Ananias' house uh, for a couple of days, he's blind. But I can't help but ask myself, had Paul discipled others to do what he had been doing? What had, what had Paul been doing? He had been persecuting the church, right? And oftentimes we see that the world's discipling others, but we got to ask ourselves, are we discipling others? Where am I going with this? I find it very interesting too that it says in verse 31 that the church had peace. Well, how did the church have peace in the midst of persecution? How did the church have peace if there was other Pauls out there? Because I'm sure Paul wasn't the only one dragging Christians out of uh, their places of worship or gatherings and Stoning them to death like they did to Stephen. How did the church have, pe have peace? It tells us. It says, I'm going to read that again. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and Quincy had peace. Can I get an amen? And they were edified. Other versions say they were strengthened. And walking in the fear of the Lord. Right there. There's the key ingredient. And walking in the fear of the Lord. Are you walking in the fear of the Lord? Now, like I tell my little girls, fear is not being scared of God, but having reverence. Having honor and giving him all the glory. Dying to your flesh. 
Are we walking in the fear of the Lord? Because if you are, you're more than likely going to have peace. Now, the, the, the sky could be falling. The, the walls could be caving in. But you're going to have peace. And it's peace that surpasses all understanding. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, are you allowing the Holy Spirit to give you what Jesus left the Holy Spirit for? Remember, as he was ascending, he said, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit, the comforter. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to do that in your life? And it says here they were multiplied. And as we look at a, um, perhaps at a dwindling church attendance or the closing of churches, we ask ourselves, why is this happening? I ask you, are you walking in the fear of the Lord? Do you have the peace of the Holy Spirit? Because if you have those two things, you are the church, you will multiply. Can I get an amen? And I feel like I could share so much about Panama and what God has been doing in the last year and a half. Um, but Pastor Dennis said he'd rush up here and take the microphone from me. No, he would never do that. <laughs> but one of the things that God is doing in Panama is, um, as you saw, wow, I, I really can't describe what we experienced in a year and a half of traveling over 90 cities, towns, and communities. I had a friend of mine introduce me to another friend a couple of weeks ago. He said, this is Jorge. He's, he's seen more of Panama than most Panamanians. I'm like, man, I never, never thought that in the middle of a of the mo world's strictest shutdowns. And just to give you a glimpse of what we experienced right when, the, uh, when this madness began, immediately the government uh, restricted men from going out to two times a week. Tuesdays and Thursdays is when we were allowed to go out. Women, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And on those days, we could only go out for two-hour windows. How did they manage that and control that? Where they had police checkpoints, and if they asked for your passport, you had to show it to them. My time window, the two-hour time windows on Tuesdays and Thursdays was based on the last digit of my passport. So if I was caught outside that time window, I could get in, into some big trouble. But in the middle of, a, uh, of, of this paralysis, we were able to work with other missionaries, and uh, we were able to acquire the right permits to be out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So while the whole country was locked down, the Flores family, by the grace of God, we were here, there, and everywhere. Over 90 cities distributing over 1,900 food bags. Never in a million years, if you asked me prior to leaving, would, would I imagine that that was going to be the case. But that's a church. That's a church for you. That's, that's a praying church. That's your guys' support. That's a praying pastor. That's, you know, Pastor Dennis calls up and checks up on me, and I love that. I love that I got that accountability. And so I just want to bless you guys today and uh, just encourage you to live fearlessly. In a time where uh, we can easily succumb to doom and gloom, again, the Lord is saying, don't focus on what the world is doing. Focus on what I'm doing. Amen. God bless you, Grandview Church. And of course, they'll be uh, in the foyer afterwards, and it'd be good to be able to stop. If you've got more questions, um, like to have some more insight on what they're doing, <clears throat> and one of them to give an update for for us today, just to be able to hear what Grandview has the privilege of being a part of. And that we just don't send a check so that we feel good about um, living in the United States, but that we see the opportunity that we have just to be able to connect together and um, to be able to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to be able to be a part of it. And it is more than just um, sending some money to help them out. It is a spiritual connection. It is a, a, a calling them and encouraging them. And so I encourage you, um, if, there's, if the Lord puts it on your heart, any special way to be praying for them or connecting with them. And it's wonderful in this day and age where you can send them an email. Hey, just praying for you today, praying for your kids. Or is there something I can be praying for you about or some way just to connect with them. And so um, if you have any questions, you can see them in the, in the foyer afterwards. Um, they do have a table out there and a few small items on there and uh, some shirts that have... Jorge was, uh, was being a model up here today also um, showing. Uh, um, and you'll look exactly like Jorge in that shirt when you put it on. So, um, But they do have some shirts out there that have the special embroidery on them. Um, and so if you'd like to help out and purchase any of those things that are there, or find just some more information about them 
Also, if you'd like to give extra towards their ministry, as I said, Grandview, once a month, we do support them, send them an offering. Um, but if you'd like to do something extra um, today, um, just again, put it on your check and in the envelope and mark it on the envelope, um, just Flores, and um, put it in the uh, offering receptacles when you leave. Um, that's, and anytime you want to do that, you certainly can. But today, if it's extra on your heart, I encourage you to just take the time to do that. You got between now and the end of the service um, to be able to make that happen. So um, it was a unique time um, when they got there and ready to go, and then everything was put a stop on it. And so I appreciated them finding ways to continue to do ministry um, while there. I know Seth Whitty just came back. You've seen his picture on the uh, on the, the, the uh, video there, if you thought, wow, that guy looks like Seth. It was. <laughs> and so it's just great for us to be able to continue to connect with. So again, uh, I encourage you to help them out extra this month um, with an offering towards them. Uh, visit the tables afterwards and uh, see what's going on back there and be able to have more conversation with them um, and be a part of things there. So it's wonderful. We can reach people in Panama. It's really great to be able to reach people right here in Quincy, too. And so I bet I mentioned it last week, but we wanted to say thank you um, for your 10 years of, of service, um, your 10 years of, of dreaming and believing, and um, the great give back this last yesterday. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be there, meant to, but wasn't able to because of some personal matters. But um, just um, thank you for being a part of Grandview and allowing us to continue to do so. So, Iveta, would you stand just again? We just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a person of willing to go after. It is always exciting to watch, but it is oftentimes um, very difficult to carry a dream. Um, it's very difficult to carry a vision and uh, to see it come to pass. Because anything that God does, you might want to write this one down, anything that God wants to do in your life, the devil's going to try to make it hard. Uh, anything, that anything, whether it's believing a promise from the word um, to being a, a word that he puts on the inside of you that he promises to bring to pass. Whatever word God gives you, the enemy is going to test it. And he will try to get us to give up along the way. And so I want, I want us to make sure that we're not discouraged. And that's one of the blessings of being a part of a family church. Um, it's not just an organization, but we're here to encourage one another, whether it's right here in our own community, maybe it's through a personal struggle that you're going through in, in your family, or maybe it's a, 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 so a family that moves off to a whole other country, um, that we can be able to continue to, to be that family one with another and help one another fulfill the vision and dream. I think it was, um, it was um, trying to think of the gentleman's name now, has a great voice, uh, I've already seen his face right now, but he would say, if you want to fulfill your dream, find enough, help enough other people fulfill theirs, and you will fulfill yours along the way. It just basically, if we're out there helping other people do what God's called them to do, God's going to make sure we got the help we needed. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and just tell him again with a smile, you need help. You, you need help. You need help. We, we all need help. We do need help in our lives. Amen. Well, get your Bibles out today. I uh, uh, want to be able to share a, a word with you also, I mean, a word that is one that is not meant to be entertaining. Um, I'm not trying to, uh, to persuade anyone through um, just some nice words here, but a very serious matter. And, and today's message I just entitled Maranatha. Maranatha is a word that is found, I believe, once, maybe twice in the New Testament, and yet it carries a deep meaning to us. In its simplicity, it is our Lord come, but it is normally with emphasis of our Lord come, or how we would say it in our daily vernacular, come quickly, Lord Jesus, with a passion, with a hunger, with a desire, with a longing that's stirring. And today, I'm not here to try to stir up some kind of emotion, but there are holy emotions that God has put in us. There's some holy passion that he wants to stir within his body, in the church. At, during this time, it is in any time, that we're longing for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we're looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus, that our life is decisions that we make. Um, they are in a reflection to the awareness and the excitement that we have on the inside of us of Christ coming into our life. 
I want you to know that every message that, I'm, that I share is, is, I do my best to be biblically based and spirit led. But some of my messages I understand that are more pertinent to some people than others. If I'm preaching on healing, if you're sitting there sick, it might have more of an influence on you than someone else. If I'm preaching on relationships and you're a single individual that maybe is not married, uh, well, if you're single, you're probably not married, but, uh, but it might, may or may not have as much impact on you. Today's message has 100% impact in this group. Every single one of us need to be reminded, to be aware, and be conscious of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that the message that we share is not only biblical, it is essential, and it is eternal. It is one that, as a shepherd, that I need to periodically remind you of that Jesus is coming again. You're not going to stop him, but you need to be ready for him. And we need to be prepared for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, if you would, please. You see, oftentimes when we go to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, people want to drop over to Matthew's gospel where the disciples said, Jesus, show us the sign or show us the sign of when you are, are going to return. Show us the sign of the end of the world. And oftentimes Christians, Christians are more interested in finding out what are the signs of the end times than being a sign to the world of the end times. We're oftentimes looking around, is this the end? Is this the end? Is this the end? Instead of making sure that we are assigned to the world around us, that they can look into your life, they can look into my life, and they can say, that's a sign. That's a sign that Jesus is coming again. The way they're living, the way they make decisions, the way they talk, the holiness that's in their life, the gathering that they spend, the, the, the emphasis and, and value they put on one another, the, it, it, it is a demonstration. Our life is supposed to be a living testimony, not only of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also of the return of Jesus Christ. And it is imperative for us at all times throughout history that the church is reminded of Jesus' return and we have a sense of urgency in our life about that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine was out uh, west, and the, him and uh, his family were doing some, uh, I'm gonna, I won't say mountain climbing in the sense that they had ropes and climbing up a mountain, but they were on some of those um, trails that were in the mountains. It was about a seven-hour round trip. How many of you know that's a trip? But a seven-hour round trip uh, they were doing. On some of the paths on this uh, mountain that they were climbing, it was steep to the one side and, and, of course, steep on the other. There was nowhere to really get off of the path. They were aware that, that in those areas that there's been known to be bears in there, so they all carried their bear spray with them. How many of you know bear spray only works if the bear is downwind from you? If the bear, if the bear is upwind from you and you spray it, it comes right back on you. So if you got a 50-50 chance, maybe, if you got it. But anyway... So they had their bear spray with them, and they had had a great day, and the, him and his family were coming down the hill. They were on one of those paths where it was basically somewhat of a drop-off here and, of course, quite a, 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 an incline of which you really couldn't climb up over there. And so when they came around that corner is when they seen the mother grizzly with her cub. Now, um, a brown bear, they'll, they'll take off because they get, they're, you know, they're as afraid of you as you are of them, supposedly or those that have lived to tell it anyway. Um, but a grizzly bear is more aggressive. A mama grizzly bear with a cub is, is a whole nother definition of aggressive. And there was nowhere for them to go. Here's the whole purpose for my story. And, and this is a, a, a good guy, fo a good follower of Jesus. At that moment, his heart question is, am I ready for, to meet Jesus? I thought that was interesting. He wasn't someone that was out doing sin. He wasn't someone that was out doing bad stuff. He wasn't someone that was in a place he shouldn't have been at at that particular time. But I thought it was just so amazing that God has put on the inside of us at those moments of crisis that he is always, always checking us. Are you ready for my return? 
are things right? Now, let's just be honest. Right at that particular time, he did not have time to get down on his knees and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins if I've committed at this particular time. He didn't have time to go through a whole list and make sure that he had forgiven. But there was a heart check at that moment. And I want us to have just a heart check today. I'm not here to criticize anyone. I'm not here to say anyone is in deep, dark sin. I'm not here to say that any of you are, are floating away from the gospel because of just the convenience and the, the luxury of life that we're in right now. But I think there's moments that we need to walk around a corner and we need to say, am I ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I ready to, to be with him at this particular moment? And, and if so, what does that look like in my life? And I was reading through, as you have been in our daily readings here, the book of First Thessalonians. And I thought it was just how interesting, coincidental we'll call it, and that as I was going through this, how many times the Apostle Paul used the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as either a motivational uh, uh, tool in here of getting your life right, um, it was a directional tool of what we should be doing at this particular time in our life, or else a revelation tool on that we can even know what happens after this life. Now, I know that the Apostle Paul did not write in chapter and verses as he goes along here, but the way it's broken up, every chapter at least once, at least once, talks about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just by repetition, that tells us how important this is. So Paul's writing to believers, just like you and me, people that are following after Christ, people that have given themselves over. These were both Jews and Gentiles. And he has been with them. He had, he's, uh, has shared with them the gospel. He'd been with them for several months, and then he moved on. Now he was coming back and sending this letter to make sure that they were following after the, the precepts that he had put in them, the word of God in their life. And I just want to take, uh, if we have the time today, we'll take a few of these verses and stir again on the inside of us. First of all, if you don't know Jesus today, the Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't, it doesn't say whoever gets up to the, the altar at the end of the church. It says whoever calls the name of the Lord. Folks, if you're having one of those moments right now where you don't know if you would die right now, if you met Mama Grizzly right now, would you know Jesus as your Savior? If not, all you need to say is, Father, Father God, forgive me of my sin, and I accept Jesus as my, as my Redeemer, my Savior, my Lord, my Master. Holy Spirit, I give you my life. I give you my life, and I thank you. I thank you for the gift that you've given to me of eternal life, your nature in me. That's as simple as that, folks. We don't want to overcomplicate it. Then we want to tell someone after service. Pa Pastor, when he was up there talking, I, I went ahead and did what he did, what he said, and I've got a new nature on the inside of me. I, now I'm ready, and I want to grow and know God more. And Paul's writing to people like that. They've just been saved. And these people have been, lived either in Judaism or in paganism or pagans their whole life. And he spends a few months with them. Think of it. Most of us in this room have been saved for years. And I will say years on that one. Years. And yet, the concern is still the same. That we become either conveniently comfortable in this world or we slip back to our old ways when we need to be focusing on the return of Jesus Christ. So, let's start here uh, at, with with the words of, uh, that Paul is giving to us in 1 Thessalonians and, and stirring on the inside of us so that we're not just looking for the signs of the last days, but, but we're, we are a sign in this day of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many times Christians are looking for the... Let's just be honest. Can we be honest for just a minute? People want to know the sign of the time of Christ's return. They want to know the calendar event, or at least the year, so they can get ready. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to be ready. You need to just be ready. You need to be ready. I, I told someone the other day, I've watched T.D. Jakes too many times. And he said, get ready, get ready, get ready. By now, you need to be ready, be ready, be ready by now. We need to be ready, and we need to stay ready for the coming of the Lord. Don't fool around. Don't be one of the... 
Folks don't have that mentality like you're waiting for Christmas Eve to go do all your Christmas shopping when it comes to following after Jesus. So I'll just wait till it gets closer to the return of Jesus. Then I'll go do what I'm supposed to do. Then I'll be what I'm supposed to be. No, you'll be deceived and the possibility of missing out everything that he has for you. So Paul writes here, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Let's read a few of these verses here, starting in verse 9 and 10. I know it might seem uh, choppy, and if you're a guest with us today, I don't apologize for the word, uh, uh, but just a const- uh, time constraint here, plus the rest of us, we've been reading for, uh, through this. But 1 Thessalonians 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul is writing here, he says, For they themselves report about, uh, about us, telling what uh, kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols. See, he's speaking to Gentiles there. And some of them were there. They were Gentiles. They turned from from the from uh, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Don't know what how your Bible says it, but I know it says something similar to that. I encourage you to underline that or write it down. It's to serve God. If you're looking for the return of Jesus, then you should be serving God in your life. He said to, uh, to, to serve the living and true God and to look forward and confidently wait for the coming of his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who personally rescued us from our coming wrath and draws us to himself, granting to us all the privileges and the rewards of a new life with him. Now, it's wonderful to jump to the bottom of that portion of Scripture and say, oh, we've got benefits and privileges in this new life. And we do. Praise God, we can put a smile on our face with that one. We've got benefits and privileges in this. But in, in the context, the Apostle Paul is saying, if you've turned from the old ways and you've turned to the true and the living God and you're expecting the coming of Jesus, then you should be serving God. You should be serving God, the one true God. The question is, who are you serving? Are you serving the one true God? Are you serving yourself? Are you serving this culture? Are you serving others around you because of of, of what they were going to benefit you'll get from them? We need to stop and ask ourselves, what am I doing with my life? I don't know about you, but it seems like life has a way of keeping me so busy that I'm distracted from the one who gave me eternal life. And I have to constantly be keeping my focus on Jesus and the possibility of his return. Now, it was, uh, you know, just this last week, I appreciated, you know, um, I was out doing a little bit of mowing and somebody came driving by on their air-conditioned bus and honked and waved at me as I was out there sweating and all that and you know and I, and that was wonderful we got the yard mode and looks good that yard's going to grow all week long and you know what i'm going to have to get out there and somebody somebody maryland or somebody uh, i'm feeling the leading here maryland or somebody can i get a witness from anybody i'm maryland and oh, man i guess dennis all oh, right uh you know that grass is going to grow and that grass is going to grow and that grass is going to grow until someday when it all burns up I gotta make sure if I'm out there growing, I'm not growing that grass. If I'm out there mowing that grass, then I'm keeping my focus. What if, what if Jesus came right now? Would He find me serving the Lord in the way that I'm doing this? Would He find me keeping my focus on on Jesus in my, the way I'm living my life? Would He find my thoughts that are often going to Him? Because so, I'm out there, I'm mowing that yard. But I'm thinking of Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes, Lord, that I might see your wonderful works in your word. So I'm out there mowing. I'm not complaining about why somebody else isn't doing this. I've got my mind on spiritual things. I'm putting myself... I didn't get upset with the guy that drove by with the air-conditioned bus, thinking, why didn't he come out here and park that thing and help me a little bit out here? But I thought, thought praise God. You know, somebody honked at me and didn't, didn't wave at me in a different way. I mean, they, there was... You got your life when you're looking for the coming of Jesus You're serving him no matter what you're doing whatsoever you do you do it as unto the Lord along the way And so as we're serving God You've got to have a mentality if Jesus is in, on the inside of us in awareness of his return folks We've got to ask ourselves who am I serving? 
That'd be a good question for you to ponder on a little bit today. Who are you serving? Especially when life gets a little rough along the edges. Things don't go well like you planned. People don't treat you the way you wanted them to. Maybe you're a wonderful person and, and, and maybe things aren't working out, you know, just perfect in your life. Are you going to serve God only when things are going well? Or are you going to serve God when everything's going great? And no matter what's happening. I mean, the Floreses, they could have got to Panama and everything shut down and they could have said, well, God, why did you let this happen to us? Instead of saying, God, what do you still want us to do while here? We've got to find a way to serve the Lord. We've got to find a way to serve God. That's the motivation that has to be stirring on the inside of every single one of us. We've got to stop and ask ourselves, who am I serving? Because when Jesus comes, we want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful church attender. Well done, thou good and faithful husband or wife. No, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He needs to find us serving him along the way. We need to be ready for his return in the way we do everything around us. If we're not careful, we allow this world to start to consume and control our time. It will allow this world to consume and control our attitude. We'll allow this world to consume and in control even our destiny. So we have to keep in mind, I'm serving the Lord. He might show up today. I'm serving the Lord. I, he, might, he might today could be the day that Jesus returns. Or maybe someone has a big timeline calendar that they pull out and say, no, according to my calendar, Jesus can't come back to here. Guess what? Jesus can come back whenever he says he's going to come back. And we need to be ready in our heart. I know that there's some prophecies that need to take place. I know there's some things that need to go on, and he can take care of them just that fast without you even knowing it along the way. So stopping and asking ourselves, deep on the inside, am I really serving the Lord and following after him? I think that's a matter of prayer. I think it's something you need to take home with you. I think it's something you need to struggle with a little bit in your life. If I was to ask you, and then I'll go to the next, next uh, chapter, if I was to ask you to write down, write down on a piece of paper and a pencil, uh, on a piece of paper, write down, how are you serving the Lord? How are you serving the Lord? What is it? I'm not even asking for a list necessarily. That would be a part of it. But how, would, how, would you, how are you serving God? What is it that you're doing with your life, your attitude, your actions, that it is obvious that you have turned from this world and you've turned to the one and true living God and that you're serving him with a heart of expectation that Jesus is coming back someday? I'm not saying that you all have to quit your jobs and move to Panama and live with Jorge and Jessica in their house. They're not either, I'm sure. But I'm saying that wherever we are, we need to have a servant's heart. Do we listen to what he tells us to do? Do we listen when we read his word? Do we ask for our eyes to be open so that when the word challenges us and, and, and calls us, that we're willing to say, Lord, in and of myself, I can't do that. I'll just be honest, part of my flesh doesn't want to do that. But I thank you that your word says, and you're speaking it to me, and so I'm going to be a good servant of the Lord and follow after you. And when you come, you will find me busy doing your work along the way. Amen? The next one, jump down here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're talking about the significance. Second Thess excuse me, sorry, I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going through each one of these chapters if you have time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we are looking at the influence and the effect of the return of Jesus Christ and how it should be on our life. 1 Thessalonians 2, 18 through 20, it says, Therefore, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Isn't that interesting? That even Satan hindered the Apostle Paul. The great Apostle Paul, this great man of faith and power, and yet he could see that Satan was constantly trying to come against him. 
I mentioned it earlier. Whatever God calls you to do, he, the enemy is going to be there to try to hinder it from coming to pass. Satan tried to hinder us. Ver, next verse goes on and says, uh, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? It is even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. For you are our glory and joy. I know I make you do this a lot, and uh, it may be irritating to some, and please forgive me, but turn to someone and say, you're a treasure. You are a treasure. You are a treasure. You're a treasure. You are, Paul said, I want you to know this, that when Jesus returns, this, this is what is going to be the real treasure. It's not how many churches I've started. It's not how many people out that got healed in my ministry. It's not the Apostle Paul here. It's not that, that uh, pieces of clothing were taken from my body and given and put on people that were sick and they were healed or demon-possessed and they were set free. This is the treasure, the joy, the glory that I will have at the return of Jesus is you, people. May we never forget that people are the real treasure of this earth. There's a lot being said right now, and, and I don't want to get too far off subject here about, you know, trying to save Mother Earth. I want you to know we should not do things that intentionally harm our environment in one sense, but folks, this is all going to get burned up one day. This is not going to get saved. This, is, this world is not eternal, but the person sitting right beside you is. And the empty chair that represents someone that doesn't know Jesus also is an eternal person that we need to reach and to be able to rescue at the same time also. Paul is saying that the presence of the Lord, when he returns, I'm so excited about Jesus coming, but what intensifies my excitement and joy is when I see you in the presence of the Lord with me at that time. It was back in um, 258 A.D., when the Roman authorities required St. Lawrence to hand over all of the riches of the church at that time. And St. Lawrence brought in the poor, the outcast, the main, and the suffering. And he said, these are the true riches of the church. It's sad to say in our day that churches are known for fighting over budgets, arguing over colors of carpet that they're going to put in, gloating over how much money that they may have, or even the beauty of their building. But we must remember the true riches of the church, the true treasure of the church is people. Could everyone say just people? People. People. People that have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that people that aren't saved aren't important. Actually, Jesus said they're the harvest that we're supposed to be going after. But we need to keep focused. When Jesus comes back, you're not going to take your favorite lazy boy chair, unless it's your husband, their favorite lazy boy, you're not going to take your favorite lazy boy to heaven with you. You're not going to take your favorite car with you, even if it's a classic. You're not going to take it with you. You're not going to take your favorite motorcycle with you when you go to heaven. Folks, the only thing that we're going to take to heaven with us are people. And the Apostle Paul, of all the suffering he went through, all the trials, all the difficulties that he went through, it was because he was serving the Lord and because he treasured people. And may we keep that alive on the inside of us, folks. You know, if we need to meet in homes before Jesus comes, we'll do so. If we need to meet in the cellar, if we need to, most of you don't know what that is. If some of you, if we need to, to, to meet in hidden places, we'll do so. It's not the building that makes it a church. It, it, it's not the denomination that makes it a church. It is we, the body of Christ, as we come together as the family of God, that we are the church, and we need to see, that, as the Apostle Paul, the great value that we have in one another, the way we treat one another, the way we care about one another. And we as believers are really, I am not going to fight over that, nor am I going to fight over this. I'm going to love this. And I'm going to enjoy the presence of God at work in our lives. Now, there's some things that we need to do. There's things that we need to say, but we've got to keep, the, the coming of Jesus Christ first and foremost in our thinking and the way that we are living our life in, our, in this day and age. Jesus is not coming back for buildings. 
He did not empower relics. He did not pay the ransom for uh, global warming. What he did is he came to seek and to save the lost and to give his life for every single person. And that puts value on people, the real treasure of this earth. And we need to go after them. We need to be blessed by understanding we are a part of the church, but we need to say there's more that we need to reach. And we need to be busy about serving the Lord in a way that's going to influence the world around us. You don't need to turn there, but let me read out of Matthew's Gospel 16, verse 25 through 27, the, the words of Jesus here. And, and hopefully this is one of those, those moments that stirs us for just a moment here and reminds us of life. It says, for whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake, Jesus' sake, uh, will find it, and that is life with me for all eternity. Verse 26, for what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, wealth, fame, success, but forfeits his soul? I read this verse in the sense that an understanding, you know, the old scales that they used to have where you would put weights on one side and he put something on the other and that would balance it out or else it would tell you which is the heaviest. And he's saying you can put all that this world has to offer you in this hand. All of the wealth, all of the success, all of the fame. And it still is not enough to equal what one soul is worth. Your soul along the way. And so as we are re reminding of that, not only for my own salvation, but it also reminds me how God values every single individual and what he was willing to give for that person and what he was willing to do for them. We need to treat one another in the body of Christ as a treasure. Some treasure just got dug up and still needs a little cleaning off on the outside, but they're still a treasure. And we need to treat him so. You know, a few weeks back now, uh, we went down to, uh, uh, where did we go down there? Uh, Arkansas. Went down to Arkansas. And um, we did some looking for some, some stones and different things that were down there with our grandson. And, of course, uh, if you give them a little extra, they'll give you a bag uh, of, 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 of rocks. And they will guarantee that there is a diamond in that bag. They'll guarantee it. And so they take us into a little room and we pour out this bag and I look at it like, it all looks like rocks to me. I can't, I, I, I look at that, I don't care how many different directions I looked at it, it all looked like rocks. Parker walked over there and said, there's the diamond right there. I thought for one sense, well, he's wrong. And the person with us, said, well, yeah, you found that one quick. And I thought, well, how in the world did he do that one? Because he was, knew what he was looking for what was a treasure and what was not. And in this world, if we're not careful, we get seeing all that this world has to offer us and we forget to see what a diamond looks like. We forget to see what, a, what, what people that need Jesus and need plucked out of that mess and say, this, this is most valuable than anything else. This, this person is more valuable than career, this person is more valuable than wealth. This person is more valuable than my fame. This person. We took those diamonds out and we separated them from the worthless stuff that was there. I can guarantee you when you leave today that there are diamonds in this world. I can guarantee you that there are lost people that are in this world. I can guarantee you that they're out there and they need someone like you that will stop and say, I can see not just the value in them as a human being, I see the value of them that needs to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And what they look like on the outside is not going to deter me from who I know Christ wants them to be on the inside and the salvation that belongs to them and how much God loves them. We, the church, have the privilege to really show the world how to value people along the way. And when we're coming up to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is going to come back whether this yard is mowed or not. 
Jesus is going to come back whether they get the new roof on the church or not. But I don't want Jesus to come back without us using every opportunity to serve him and sharing with the lost that are around us. Using every method that we can. And one of the greatest methods, here it is folks, one of the greatest methods is you. It's you. You being that witness to the world around you. And you living like you're expecting the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. There's just one left here that I want to take the time to, to read for us today. I'm running out of time. You can read through the rest of 1 Thessalonians, and you can see in every chapter where it talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 3, let me read it to you. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13, and it says, and, and may the Lord cause you to increase. Isn't that interesting? He wants to cause an increase in your life and to excel and overflow in love for one another. So you're all doing a really good job, but he wants you to excel in love. He's doing a good job, but he wants you to increase in love. And for all people, just as we also do for you. Verse 13, so that he may strengthen and establish your hearts throughout with, without blame in holiness in the sight of our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ's return for all of his saints. Folks, when Jesus comes back, he, he, he's, he wants us to be holy. He wants us to be holy in our life. There's probably nothing that is more uh, fearful uh, in a bad way than to think that you got left behind. There was a, even a series of movies, Left Behind, and it was supposed to scare the bejeebies out of you so that you're going to follow Jesus all the time. And the and only thing that usually happened was when, if, I, mean, I remember, uh, uh, especially as a teenager when it first came out, boy, if you came home, and you expected someone to be there and no one was home, you thought, oh no, oh no. TV's on. You know dad wouldn't leave with the TV on. The TV's on and radio's on and no one's home. I got left behind. I got seven years. I got to figure this thing out before I don't get the mark and I'm going to die. And, and, and we, there was a, a panic that hit you at that particular time. That's not what he's talking about here. He doesn't want us to have, have this panic that we got left behind because of something in our life. This is it. When we really focus on loving people by the power of God on the inside of us, we're letting that Christ-like nature on the inside of us really consume us and control us. When we are excited about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life, holiness is, a, is just an, is an outcome and a result of that. When you're thinking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, temptation loses its control real quick over our life. If I'm aware that Jesus could come anytime, I want to make sure that he, when he comes, that he finds me doing what he's called me to do. And this helps us, that I'm not trying to get holy, I'm trying to get holy, I'm trying to get holy, I'm trying to get, no, Lord Jesus, just increase your love in me more and more. Lord Jesus, may your love so abound in my life that I'm loving the right thing, I'm loving the right people, and most of all, I'm loving the right God. And if I got my love life right, then, then holiness is just a natural outcome from that, if I could say it that way. Because the things of this world, they lose their control over my life. They lose their power over my life. And so that I'm going to serve him all the days of my life with privilege and with love. What's the sign of his coming? We'll just close it with this. According to Jesus, I mean, if you want to know biblical prophecy, the greatest sign, the most predominant sign, the number one sign of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is there'll be a great delusion across the body of Christ. Here's the problem. If you're in a moment of delusion, you're not going to see and be prepared for his coming. And so if we'll be more focused on the epistles where Paul's writing, if we'll be more, found ourselves serving God, if we'll find ourselves treasuring other people, if we'll find ourselves loving God and loving his people to the point that I have no love for this world that is around me, you're not going to be deceived. You're not going to be taken off guard. You're going to be prepared and be ready. You might even be like one of those people that's like, Lord Jesus, come quickly, but wait just a little. I got some more people I want to share with before you come. I've got a little bit more work for the kingdom that I want to accomplish 
we start to have the heart like the Apostle Paul, where he was saying, you know, I want to leave this place. That would be better for me, but it's more needful for you that I stay around for a little bit longer. Folks, we got to get a heart on the inside of us. We're ready for Jesus' coming, but what we need to realize when with maturity is that the world's not ready for his coming, and we need to be doing our part. Amen? I think we might just share a little bit more on this Wednesday night. We didn't get all the way through that. This gives you a chance to refocus on this, be thinking about it. And just, uh, and of course, ex unless Jesus comes before Wednesday night, and then I won't be here. There'll be a guest speaker, and I don't care who it is. You, 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 whoever's left, you can figure that one out. But uh, some of these things we, we, we say jokingly, and there is a sense of seriousness. The church we have as a whole has be so, become so consumed with this life and so busy with this life that if we're not careful, we have lost focus of the one who gave us eternal life. And we start to be more consumed about the things of this world instead of the things that God wants us to be involved in. Amen? Amen. Father God, I just thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you for a church uh, that doesn't need to be entertained, a church that does not need to be... Uh, 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 given words of just fluffiness, but that they're able to, to be reminded and have the, the meat of the word that is given to us. Lord, today, I, I thank you for the Flores as a, a physical example uh, of those that are willing to commit themselves in serving you in such a visible way. But Lord, every single one of us in this room, you've called. You, you've not called us all to go to foreign countries, but you've called us all to, to do kingdom business. Jesus, you're a great example. At, at 12, you said, I must be about my Father's business. And so we just ask the Holy Spirit to just start to, to stir on the inside of us. Awaken us again. It doesn't matter uh, our age. You were reminded us Wednesday night. Say not. It, don't tell me how old you are. Don't tell me you're too young or too old. Don't tell me you're retired. Don't, don't, don't say that I haven't uh, got my driver's license yet. Allow the Holy Spirit to stir you right where you are. Refresh you that there is a purpose for you, there is a plan for you, there, there is things that he has for you to do to find serving him every day of your life, your attitude and your actions. And Father, I thank you that you are opening our eyes to see the treasures that are around us. That the body of Christ, that we, we value people, that we, we, we see them in, in this world where there's, there's so much rubbish, there's so much just earthly things Lord may the diamonds stick out those, those a people that you want us to reach and to touch and to pluck out of the situation of darkness and to be able to bring Jesus to them show them to us so that we might not only that they come to know Christ but be a part of the body to be transformed and to be changed along the way and Lord I just thank you for liberating us from religion that we're not working hard to be holy. We're not str striving to be better than others or don't have just a list of do's and don'ts. But we have a, a growing, increasing love of God in our life. And that love for you, that we're looking for that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We long to be with you. Thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen.